All right, Scale. Let's talk about the man behind the wire then, because this has come up now two weeks in a row. You've been coached by Davy Fitzgerald, you've been <laughs> a goalkeeper in his team, so you can give us a, an inside track into what was going on here, because eventually the Lee Stewarts decided to move the man who was part of the Waterford management team, who was also behind the goal in Dungarvan the week before, and we wondered what instructions he was given out to Billy Nolan when he was in goal. So obviously he got moved. But then the picture emerges, and I think Sportsfile took this picture. I'm just having a look at it in front of me here now. And it looks like there's a bit of tape around his ear, which could well be concealing some kind of listening device, in the same way that we saw the picture. And I think it was Buff Egan who initially spotted this one with Mark Fanning the year before. It seems that there's very clearly instructions coming from the sideline by way of either the man behind the wire or potentially an actual wire, which is giving out instructions about puckouts to yeah. the goalkeeper. Well, he's not listening to Spotify anyway, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> this all, I, 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 I witnessed it firsthand 16 years ago, which is a long time ago now, when I was part of the Fitzgibbon team with Fitzy. He situated a guy on the sideline uh, who would hold either a water bottle, a high-vis vest off memory, or a hurdle, something like that, or a schlitzer. And each one, each each item was signified in the area of the pitch. So, for example, if he held the water bottle, that goes to number 10. This is back in time now. It was just lumped the ball. There was no sharper gauss. There was no you know, tippy tappy. And they, so if he held the high, the vest or the hat or whatever it was, 11, and if he held the ball, whatever it was, it goes to 12. And so me, just being me at that age, every now and then I'd just run egg, you know, and just hit it. And straight away, I'd have a message come down to me, ran down to me, stick to the, stick to the structure. Because what I did is it provided all the outfield guys knew where the ball was going as well. they take a quick look, look over where the... The item was, and you know, at the time, I didn't, I didn't mind it too much because it was working because we're we're winning, right? But nowadays, when I look at the earpiece, right, I'm thinking, what's Billy Nolan? He's either getting information or he's getting instruction. Instruction, I completely disagree with because you're taking the onus, you know, you're, you're taking the natural ability, the natural instinct of the goalkeeper to see what's in front of him, to play the game in front of him. Because no matter what you see, if you're in this, if you're on the sideline or behind the goal or you're in the stand and you're wired up to Billy Nolan, when you see it and get the message to Billy. And Billy, I suppose, understands information, processes it, the opportunity could be gone. Whereas Billy can see it himself, and the opportunity is right there. So I don't agree with this instruction, formal instruction. But if he's getting information, I don't have a problem with it. I just, I just don't, I don't agree with the way he's getting it. If, if, like me personally, if I'm playing with the club, I like information coming back to me every 10 minutes. You know, we've won X amount of balls here, this guy's going well, whatever. Except little, little nuggets, and it's just information. And give me the information and let me process it myself, you know. Whereas if someone came down to me, we're joking about in our club WhatsApp group, if someone had put a, an earpiece into my ear and told me where to puck the ball, I'd hit the ball straight at him. You know what I mean? <laughs> just out of pure viciousness because I just think it takes the natural instinct and probably the best element of a player is his natural instinct and his gut feeling to go what he sees in front of him. And when you, when you strip that back, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's devolution. It's not, it's not evolution at all. Um, and I'm very surprised with it. And I'd like to see just just gone away with it because when you look, look at the way Billy played, 100% himself, no problem. Take me back then to this guy who was on Davy's management team who's in the terrace or in the stand and people are looking across for messages and so on. Would it not get to a point where the half-back line of the college team that you're playing against would notice that their marker is having a quick look across or that you're looking across at this guy before you hit the ball out? Well, no, it didn't. No, truthfully speaking, well, it didn't. Like, you know, you consider in Fitzgibbon times those days we had four games, hmm. you know, and I suppose video analysis wasn't a big thing back then. It wasn't even present. So statistics weren't even present. So, and you, look, don't get me wrong, we, we, were, we concealed it pretty good now as well, you know. <laughs> so, like, I'd look over every so often and, you know, i see it. And I think it was, I think, I could be open to correction, but I actually think it was the Meads manager, Saoirse Bulfin, who spent a lot of time with Fitzy. I think he was the one doing it, him or Bertie Sherlock from Tipperary. But, uh, and again, they did well concealing it also. So, it just became, I suppose, a bit of structure. And it was kind of like, I won't call it a set play now, you know, but at least people knew where the ball was going. Whereas when you've got an earpiece in the goalie's ear, Nobody out the field knows where the ball is going. Nobody has a clue around the goalkeeper, you know. And I, 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 again, I reiterate, if it's information, I've no issue. If it's instruction, fuck that. Right, so whether it's information or it's instruction, was Davy getting the info over to Saoirse Bulfin for what he was to do? Or was Saoirse Bulfin, let's say, I don't know, empowered, let's use that phrase, to be able to say to you, well, actually, I see a pattern they've moved across go 10 this time, go 12. Like, who's actually making yeah, the goals? Yeah, so Saoirse Bulfin at the time, he's a bruff man and would have played in goals himself. Um, so I think there was a balance whereby <clears throat> he was probably 75% empowered off memory and maybe every so often Davy would check in, you know. 
I'd say he'd check in and if he wanted to change something he'd, he'd pass the message like if someone like you know Owen Cadigan or Irritanian with the two wing forwards you know two two <laughs> behemoths in the wing forwards if one was going well another you know maybe overload that that, that way a bit more but um, I'd say ultimately the overall structure would come from Fitzy um, but that, that Sirius was given the, the license if you want to call it that to, to, to call the plays <laughs> as, as he saw fit and again the type of game back then facilitated that it wouldn't work in today's today's world yeah, and did Davy micromanage everything to that detail, or were puckouts a particular interest to his then? Um, I wouldn't say like again at the time he, I, I think he had to because I don't think there was people, you know, delegated into every position. So there was no such thing as backs coaches, forwards coaches. You know, S and C was just about to come in at the time, so I think he had to have a little nugget of, of influence on, on them all. Um, but particularly on how the team wanted to play, he was heavily involved in that. So if that was you know, a, a set system or obviously player selection, don't get me wrong, or a pattern of play or, or the pace of play or how we trained, that that was all him. And then he'd, again, he'd empowered the people around him to a certain degree to to, <clears throat> to ensure that they, they, they moulded everything towards his his, his mindset or his way, way he thought about it. Um, and if you look at today with, with all the information that you can you can access and all the platforms and people and professionalism, I'd say ultimately he's he's like a, a CEO of a business, so like he's managing director. I think he managed everyone uh, during the week uh, manages tells the coach coach how he envisages the session and then just you know loses issues at the weekend yeah. <laughs> well, for real time info there's potential for a lot more information to actually be passed on to the players now at this stage and look Paul my read on is I'm not going to walk you into any trouble here and what I will say is well you walk me in yeah wouldn't you no, no, no. <laughs> yeah Scale can talk as freely as he wants yeah. no problem he's played under the system he's telling us what's happened I'm having to interpret what I've seen here which is it's for me it's too much of a coincidence that two goalkeepers in a row have had their ears taped uh, I can't think of any other reason that they're going to have their ears taped up I don't think it's a case of two goalkeepers in a row wearing jewellery that they have to cover or something like that so I'm going to make the inference that it seems that the goalkeepers have got some kind of receiving device to be able to get um, instruction uh, through their ear like does this sit right that you could have a guy behind the goals handing out instructions you could have information coming through an earpiece should this not be restricted purely to a mere forna as opposed to you know potentially technology being used how does it sit with you paul yeah i suppose um it, it it's just is it in the spirit of the game really to be doing it i don't know like i mean again it's just an aid it's it's a team trying to get one step ahead i wouldn't like it to be honest uh, being if if I was a goalkeeper or even if I knew the, the goalkeeper on my team was being dictated to, I suppose you know like if you have the likes of you're dealing with intercounty goalkeepers here, um, they're supposedly the best person in that county to be the goalkeeper. They're probably the best subject matter expert to actually tell you what a good puckout is, and their instincts are very important in this. It's like a free taker, you know, as in they're good at what they do. Puckouts now even are, you know, they it's not just a case of puck it as long and as far as you can or as high as you can. Like, they're hitting laser beams at fellas, they're popping balls into spaces, they're doing whatever. And I think their instinct is important in that. Now, again, what, what is an important aspect to figure out here is how many puck outs are being dictated to this person. But my view on it would be that if I have, let's say, for example, Owen Murphy in the goal, I know several occasions of where Owen Murphy looked down, and it might seem ridiculous to say that from 80 yards he's able to make eye contact with a player and the body language, that player knows that he's about to get it. He's able to create space. Like Walter Welsh, there's a great example of Walter Welsh against Limerick in 2019, scored a point. It was the fifth point he scored against Limerick. And uh, I think it was Brendan Cummins was actually commentating on the match. And it was a case of, Owen looked down, he made eye contact with Walter Welsh from that distance. And Walter Welsh, known from training with Owen, what he was about to do, Owen hit him straight to him into the hand and over the bar. Brian Cody wouldn't have been able to see that. So how could Davy, Davy's perspective on the game or whoever else is, now maybe the keeper or the, the goalkeeping coach behind the goal, maybe he's calling it, but I just think there's no better person to actually see what's going on the pitch than the goalkeeper. Um, and taking that person's instincts away from them and telling them, hook it down to number 10, whereas his instincts are saying, actually, I could nail a, a pass here to the midfielder, but I can't do it. I think that creates a disjointed effect on the team. And not only does the goalkeeper's instinct go down the drain, but also now the outfield players know that well, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing here. The call has just been gone to the goalkeeper that's been decided 15 seconds ago. It doesn't matter if I run here. So there's lots of aspects here that I just think it's probably, it's, it's definitely not fine-tuned yet, but I also think that it's it's not in the good spirit of the game for the creativity of players to actually just let them go and hurl and perform and just 
you know, to have the autonomy to go at it. I don't think the likes of John Kiley would ever put in something like this. But it's Davy's style. That's his style, and that's what Skehill is saying. That I mean, he has form to do it, so maybe that's just what he wants to do. And look, we could be sitting here in six weeks' time or ten weeks' time saying, gee, it's working out really well. So early do- early days on it yet, but I wouldn't be a big fan of it. Mm. See, Skell, a few years ago, I went to watch an intercounty training session and Brendan Cummins uh, was in as effectively doing a goalkeeping session for the night. And everything that he was teaching the goalkeepers that night was entirely counter to this idea. So what he did was he basically put the goalkeepers in either end and then he got players, primarily subs, to run different lines and to run different positions. And the whole idea was that the instruction would then be basically hit that the guys were going to move into a different direction. And the goalkeepers had to actually make the call about where they were going to poke the ball to. And the whole point of the instruction and the drill that they were doing was that the goalkeepers would be able to think on the fly themselves Mm -hmm. and to see things that were happening, patterns on the pitch, and to make the right pass. That that was more important than a goalkeeper being able to just mullet the ball down the pitch a long distance. So it was about picking somebody out and making the right decisions. This, to me, sounds like if you're telling the goalkeeper that there's pre-planned moves and you're going to go this way, this sounds a little bit more like NFL than it does... National Hurling League. Yeah, I suppose the thing about NFL is the call comes in pre-snap. So every player on that team uh, knows the call and knows the exact routing because they're practicing to a tee. Whereas in Hurling, you're not afforded that opportunity because only the goalkeeper is hooked up in this instance. And like what Brendan did that night with that, with that county team, I fully agree with you because you're allowing the goalkeeper to be both, if this makes sense, reactive to the situation and then be proactive to where, where the ball goes. Whereas if you put complete instruction on top of him, you just take that ability away from him. And goalkeeping is all about instinct. It's all about your gut. Even, like, like you said, Murph, you're reading people's body language. You're, you're looking at the way a guy shapes and you're kind of giving him a nod go and he makes a shot. You know, it's all, pro, like, it is proactive to a degree, right? But you, goalkeeping is all reactive. Look at what's in front of you. Assessing the situation in real time. In real time, which is milliseconds, to be honest, in intercom to level, whereby you're assessing the opposition set up, let's say, if, if this lad moves left, should I put it right? If I put the ball over a guy, will it get down on time? You're trying to assess all this information in real time. And I just personally wouldn't like a guy in my ear. Because <laughs> even the crowd, you block out the crowd. You, when, you, when you're there as a player, you, like, again, everyone will tell you. It's like you, the crowd aren't even there. You know, you don't, you, They don't get into you at all. But if there's someone right in your ear who is part of your setup, it just carries more weight, if you know what I mean. So, so you'd be more in tune to it. And if you take your mind off it for a millisecond, you've, you've lost a whole host of opportunities. And like Christy Connor would be the same way with us, Will. He would constantly put these... And Christy has this knack of putting these crazy situations in place where you have to just work out, you know, nearly like a bloody physics exam before you get the ball out to somebody, you know. But it's all honed at trying to get you, the, you the goalkeeper, you the person to make a constructive decision in real time for the best of the team. And again, Christy was, was brilliant at making you feel uncomfortable in, in, in real time so that you get more used to the situation and then execute better when you go into a high intense game. So, like, I overall, I just think it's it's all wrong. And Murph used the word spirit there. Spirit is one thing, yeah, of the game, you know, you know thinking globally. But just Billy, I'm thinking about the goalie. Billy is the person I just think is wrong for him. And his own instincts should be utilised more than that than the, the fucking earpiece. 